It's a pleasure to address you all. I'm actually going to um, talk about today the best possible career advice I can give peace engineers, um, because I want to make this quick and I want to make this as impactful as possible for you guys. Um, I want to suggest to you that if you want to have a really powerful impact in the peace domain, um, one of the accidentally bad advices that, uh, that all of us in academia have been giving students who are interested in peace for, I would say, five or six decades now, is that you should start an NGO. And I want to suggest to you that your best option, please, is to start a for-profit peace tech startup. And specifically, a for-profit positive peace tech startup. And I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about what that is and why to do that. But I'm going to do this by introducing you to um, something that I call the rule ratio. Um, if you have limited time in your life and you have limited resources and you want to have the greatest possible positive impact, um, you have to decide where you're going to spend your focus and how you're going to spend your focus. And so this comes down to some strategy here. Um, and the first question, if you're working on peace and you want to have the most impact, is to think about um, what do you know about human behavior? Are we fundamentally good to each other as a species or are we fundamentally bad to each other? And the answer to that question should really determine where you spend most of your efforts as, as a peace engineer or as a, as a potential peace engineer. And by the way, there are several approaches into peace engineering. Margarita is a real engineer. I'm a finance guy. Um, uh, there are other people who are, who are designers and so on. And building, building peace tech, um, any of those entrances into creating new peace tech uh, is, is um, a, a possible successful uh, career strategy. The, um, the thought experiment I want to suggest to you is that um, imagine you could offer any two random people anywhere in the world um, the chance to cheat each other, uh, the chance to do something bad to each other so that one of them would benefit and the other one would, would lose. And there would be no consequence. There would no, be no possibility of discovery. There would be no possibility of punishment. Um, and I just want to ask you, if you could do that experiment um, once, what do you think is the percentage chance that, uh, that somebody uh, that uh, one stranger would cheat another stranger. Most people tend to think that it's very high. Um, imagine that you could do that experiment a billion times or two billion times. Then you would actually know something about our species, something quantifiable and something very empirical that we've never had the chance to know about ourselves before. Okay, I'm going to do a quick survey then and ask, ask uh, just very quickly, we'll make this interactive. Um, what percentage, if we could do this experiment with a billion people or two billion people or three billion people, very quickly, call out some numbers to me, what percentage do you think would cheat each other? 15. 10%. I understand. Yes. So somebody said 10%, I heard that. No, someone said 40. 15, 40. 10, 15 percent. Okay. Online, we have three. Please to see, para mi, 40 or 50. 40 or 50 percent? Yeah. So you would say then that we're, as a species, we're basically half bad, half good. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's not uncommon, and, and I'm a little bit surprised that people have not been estimating much higher than that. Any other guesses? This is my, this is my little test to see that you're actually awake, to make sure you're actually awake. <laughs> Does anybody think it's higher than 50%? Okay, well, that's encouraging anyways. Um, so let me tell you about Colin Rule. Colin Rule was an entrepreneur in residence in our lab back in uh, 2010, 11. 
Um, he came to us from PayPal and eBay. And PayPal and eBay have this interesting problem where um, they were, uh, this was before they built uh, any kind of, you know, reputation system or other kinds of safeguards into their system. And they were doing something north at the time, if I recall correctly, north of 60 million transactions per day between complete strangers all over the world. And so what I want you to see is that with Peace Tech these days, you can run a flipped lab experiment where you can see what's happening in the real world rather than having to bring students into your lab and, and design a, a kind of a, 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 um, a more theoretical experiment for them. You, you can actually just go out and see what's actually happening in the real world. Um, what Colin found was that even with no or very few safeguards in place, even before um, eBay and PayPal went to a lot of trouble to build uh, reputation systems and uh, much, much better tracking and so on, on average, uh, and they already had people all over the world buying and selling things from each other. I think you'll be surprised by the result because with a sample size of something like 60 million people per day, there were less than 3% of people where either one or both parties rated the transaction as unsatisfactory for any reason. Less than 3%. What that tells you about our species is that we are profoundly hardwired to be good to each other because what you also see in the data is that the vast majority of human beings even at their own expense, will go out of their way to make sure that a complete stranger who never interacts with them again will have a positive experience of them. The vast majority of human beings will do that. This has really serious implications for your career choices, and this is why I bring it up today. But there's one more very interesting uh, piece to this um, data, which is that of that 3% of people who rated um, the transaction as unsatisfactory, one or both parties rated it as unsatisfactory, 2.7 of those 3% said it was because it was a misunderstanding. They did not think anything malicious was involved. What that means is that only 0.3% of all of those transactions on average were rated as deliberately intentionally malicious. And I want you to remember that number, 0.3%. Because what this means is if you have limited time and energy and resources for your career in a peace engineering space, you need to be thinking about where you get the most force multiplier, which number is going to be the biggest multiplier of your talents. Um, you need to be pondering if you are focused on reducing bad behavior in the world, the multiplier you're going to have on your efforts is somewhere between 0.3 and 3%. It just doesn't give you very much return on your life investment. It's nonetheless very important work and Colin himself chose to focus on the, the middle, the 2.7%, the because um, if, if you are eBay and PayPal, if you're doing 60 million transactions a day, you can't hire enough people to help with the, um, the dispute resolution between people who are having a misunderstanding with that 2.7%. Uh, so Colin has done heroic work in that space and he has spent, since um, been launched, uh, his, the tools that he built uh, for eBay and PayPal were spun out and launched by eBay and PayPal in a, in a separate company called Modria that Colin ran and, and has just had a very successful exit out of. Um, so even there, there's a lesson for you, which is that you have a far better chance of having a career with a significant positive impact in the world if you at least focus on the 2.7% of, of misunderstanding rather than the 0.3% of, of um, deliberate, intentional, malicious, bad behavior. But I want to direct your attention to the other 97%. Because when you're looking for a force multiplier for your life and your energy and your resources, um, 
I want you to have the most positive impact in the world. And what that means is you need to be looking for technology that is measurably increasing positive, pro-social, mutually beneficial behavior. And I want to give you a quick example of that technology today, um, just as an inspiration for you. Uh, in order to do that, I want to clarify a little bit of the terminology that we have used a lot in the peace and conflict studies domain. Um, a lot of people, the moment you say peace, they think you're working on reducing war or reducing violence. And I want to suggest to you that for clarity from now on, you should just tell those people they're working on violence reduction. And that's not the same as peace. That's quite different in fact, because you can get rid of all the violence in the world and still not have anybody being good to each other. And what we all actually care about at the end of the day is how good can we be to each other? Even if you reduce conflict or manage conflict, you're just decreasing bad behavior. Now you're in the 2.7%. It's going to have much more impact for you in your life than the 0.3%, but it's still not where you could have the most impact by any means. So if you're looking instead at where and how could you create um, any kind of uh, a multiplier for that 97%, one example to take away with you as inspiration. This is one of the... Uh, it's, it's, it's now a legacy company in the space, um, but, but it's one where one of the founders was deliberately intentionally thinking, would it be possible to build technology that measurably increased peace in the world? And um, this founder looked at um, a little nonprofit. And so here we have a, a very nice A-B split test, another natural experiment of the same basic business model, the same basic technology, uh, structured as a nonprofit. How many of you have ever used couchsurfing? Anybody? Which one? Couch surfing. Oh, yeah, one person. Okay, it's a service where um, people will allow strangers to stay in their home basically, um, but, but not charge them anything. Um, so it's the nonprofit version of Airbnb. And what I want to talk to you about today, by contrast, is Airbnb, because I want you to see these two technologies are fundamentally the same, but one is an NGO, one is a nonprofit, and one is a for-profit. Um, the, the, the technical solution, the business model, um, the, or sorry, the service model, these, these are pretty much identical. Um, it's only the uh, financial part, uh, how the organization is structured, that is different. And I realize I'm being provocative here because I realize that capitalism and profit and so forth are um, not popular these days. But I want you to have a chance um, with an engineering and quantitative and empirical mindset to really look at the difference in results here. Um, Joe Gebbia, who was one of the founders of Airbnb, was quite deliberate and intentional about thinking, what if we could build a technology that could measurably increase the peaceful behavior of hospitality. And his theory of change was if more people from different cultures and different religions and different political orientations and so on, interacted with each other by visiting each other in each other's homes and had a good experience of somebody very different from themselves, there would be more peace in the world. And of course, contact theory and a bunch of other things support his hypothesis. What you ended up with was a team of people who were able to make a huge amount of money that they could reinvest in their mission. And so if you look at the impact today, and I'll let you all look it up online yourselves, if you look at the impact, the economic impact, just of Airbnb, just in Latin America, just in 2022, which was a rough year because of the pandemic, they generated $16 billion of total spending just in Latin America. 53% of their hosts are women. And so a whole lot of that money went to women. Something, something north of $8.9 billion of GDP directly supported by Airbnb by yes spending. Something north of $4.5 billion of wages and salaries and other income supported in Latin America by that business model 
all in service of measurably increasing hospitality behaviors in the world. And I want to suggest to you that hospitality behaviors are just one possible positive peace behavior. So when you're looking for a career, I want to suggest to you that you should be looking in that direction. And I want to suggest to you that you look for more examples like that as models, uh, as role models and as templates for where you could have the most positive impact as a peace engineer or working in a career related to peace engineering. In the process, I want you to see that by increasing the economic activity around, uh, in this case, in the Airbnb case, just around hospitality, um, increasing the resources that people had to do hospitality, increasing the rewards that they received from doing hospitality. By the way, Airbnb is now the largest private diplomacy service in the world. They have trained more people in how to be good to complete strangers who are different from them than any national government has trained their diplomats. And so even if you were just running a training service, they're already outstripping almost everybody. So I hope you see the, the distinction I'm making here and the importance of the distinction of positive peace technology and for-profit positive peace technology startups. And I hope you see that one of the things you are doing by building a company like this is giving institutional investors who are managing, for example, your pension fund or your, your bank savings account or your health insurance pool or premium pool or your life insurance premium pool, you are giving those people a place where they can invest your life's funds in a way that makes the world a more positive place. And none of those investments, unfortunately, can be directed to a nonprofit because those people have a fiduciary obligation to you to earn a return on your savings so that you can retire one day or so that you can have health coverage or, or life coverage. So I hope you see the strategy there. I hope that um, um, gives you a different way of looking at the potential careers in this space. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Oh, one other thing. I hope you also see that in the process of creating these rewards and incentives in the hospitality space, you probably prevented a significant number of people who otherwise would have had no other options from falling into lives of violence or conflict as well. You just made it much more attractive for people to move into the positive engagement space instead. So you also probably had a larger uh, violence reduction and conflict reduction impact with a, with a strategy like this than if you had started a little NGO directly uh, attempting to reduce conflict or violence. All right, now I'm happy to take questions, please. Questions? Let me change. How about complaints? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with complaints. Question. Somebody challenge me, please. <laughs> I'm going to go back to what uh, Joe talked yesterday. Is using technology. This is using technology to make a difference. And so they went and trying to connect people, become better people. At, at the same time, second effect is, this is about diplomacy. So something that we want to do in engineering is that, and something working with the labs is that these engineers need to be diplomats and we need to train diplomats on peace engineering so they can negotiate better. So that's part of what we're doing. Questions? Here's a question. Yeah, um, so I like the idea of actually, um, I wouldn't say leaving behind NGOs, but you're turning like using for profits in order to make it sustainable. However, I would like to uh, like raise the, the, the question of how to balance the objective or the final aim of an NGO that is usually social profit when the market model it's going so great that you may leave the social profit behind you know what i mean like when you're creating a for-profit sometimes market tends to um 
dominar. Um, yeah, at the end of. Like dominate, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have actually tried to give the lecture in Spanish, but I, I speak um, Dominican, which is, uh, so I'm a gringo with a very strong Caribbean accent. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and people tell me it's not even the same language, so. <laughs> um, but I do understand, it, so I'm happy to take questions in Spanish as well. Yes, so the um, market forces are certainly strong. I want to suggest to you that they're not nearly as strong as the forces that are working against you when you are running an NGO. Um, the number of, of nonprofits that, that have ever uh, succeeded uh, is small as a percentage. The, the, the percentage of them that have ever scaled past a million dollars a year in revenues, you can count on two hands in the US where there's a large economy, right? So if you're doing this um, in, in other countries with much smaller economies, the number of nonprofits that actually ever get to any size or scale is, is, is usually negligible, unfortunately. This is why I'm, I'm telling you that as your professors, this was a mistake on our part to give you the advice that if you're focused on peace, you should be thinking about doing a nonprofit instead. Um, the, and then I want to give you some examples of how to fight the dominating market forces. And, and I want to give you examples of uh, two companies that, I, that in many respects, I don't like at all. Um, but we're often told that um, with um, the reason you should start a nonprofit is because there's no possible market yet, and there's no possible paying customer yet, and there's nobody who can afford what you're doing yet, and, and there's no way that a profit model can succeed and so on. So I'm going to point you to two companies, two tech startups, Uber and Amazon. Um, neither of those companies made any money for years and years and years. And if you go back and read Jeff Bezos's um, shareholder reports, um, he told his investors up front, if you're looking for profit, do not invest in Amazon. If you're looking for profit, we are not right for you. We're building market share. And if we succeed in building market share, the value of your shares will go up, but I will never pay you a dividend. And he told people right up front, and you can do that if you're running a, a for-profit. Um, similarly with Uber, um, uh, venture capitalists spent billions uh, helping Uber uh, capture market share. And uh, to my knowledge, they still haven't turned a profit um, and, and quite likely never will, um, but they can still be profitable for many, many people. And, and so you're not under nearly as much uh, force from the marketplace as you think you are. I hope that gave you a little bit of an answer. Yeah, thank you. Hey, we have a... hey Mark. It's... Yes. Hey, Bruce. Great to see you. Um, the dichotomy be between for and nonprofit is a false dichotomy, as you say. I don't, I missed your lecture, um, but I'm sure you talked about cooperative models, um, which are very popular. In, in Europe and, and Latin, uh, REI comes to mind as an outdoor goods uh, uh, chain that we have here in the States um, that exists since 1925, I think, as a yep. member organization, every credit union is a cooperative. Yep. So there are trusts that are, that are yep. permanent structures. So there are many, my point is, and I'm sure it's your point, there are many legal structures that business activity can take place in where the opportunity for profit is not the prime directive, but service to the members slash customers can be and, and, and is. Uh, correct, Bruce. But um, in my 12 minutes here, though, I was, I was being deliberately provocative and, and not addressing those beautiful middle cases. If you're asking me personally, the kind of structures I use again and again, it would be trusts. Um, but, uh, but in this case, I'm trying to get people to see that even the edge case of blatant for-profit companies um, can be operated to have measurably more positive impact than a nonprofit typically will ever be able to have. Uh, Richard, I see your hand up, please. So I, I have a question. Um, also, in terms of how how to measure 
social capital as a return on investment of an action or an intervention, and also how you how you capitalize on the well-being of the population. So how is that investment is then turned into a salutogenesis and a synergistic to create more health? I, I love this question. Thank you. It's a great one. I suggest that the uh, we have technology has given us a great gift here. We now have. Uh, distributed sensors all through the environment that can directly measure human behavior. And many of those sensors, are, uh, which are getting better every day and more distributed everywhere every day, can directly measure human social behavior as well. And so I suggest to you that the, the quantifiable um, impact you actually really care about that most other things are a proxy of is actual measurable increases in pro-social mutualist human behavior. Uh, the other reason I'm being provocative and, and using the for-profit edge case here to get you all thinking is because almost all new value creation happens from mutualist pro-social cooperative behavior once it gets over what we would call the collaboration line where mutual benefit exceeds the cost of engagement. So. If I'm at work with Margarita, um, no matter how bad a day we have, um, if we're working in an environment where we have a solid business model and we've got uh, uh, for-profit revenues and investors and so on, no matter how bad a day we have, we're still getting paid to come back and try again tomorrow. And that ability to get paid to come back and try again tomorrow scales hugely. And by the way, most of the uh, actual positive pro-social behavior you want to measure. Um, now that we have sensors in the environment and we can see where do people have the most interaction with people who are most different from them in their lives, it's eight hours a day, five days a week in the workplace. That's where most of us are having by far the most interaction uh, with people who are most different from us. So if we can make those interactions a little more positive, I think that's the best way by far to be measuring social capital and social impact. Richard, I see your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yes, I, I would just like to ask how this applies in the field of healthcare. And I'm noting that Western Europe particularly has got better outcomes than USA. And USA is actually for profit, not sorry, not for profit, basically. Correct. And uh, Western Europe is is even less for profit. Correct. It's kind of a social investment in the society by government with the approval mostly of the people. Can you can you comment on that? Uh, I can give it a shot. You, you go directly to the, the, the worst edge case in, in, the, in this example, and, and thank you for, for uh, stress testing this. Um, the, um, but you, you make exactly the right distinction, I think, that the U.S. is a blatantly for-profit approach to, to healthcare, um, ungoverned by, by um, nearly as much regulation as any other country in the world applies, um, very little transparency. And, and so it, it certainly is possible to corrupt and uh, um, uh, disalign uh, for-profit structures. I'm not by any case making the argument that all for-profit businesses are, are good. Um, it really hugely comes down to what do you do with your profits? Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you're mission-driven, how much can you transparently show that you are reinvesting your profits in your mission? And in many cases, uh, particularly in the US, it's, it's blatantly obvious that um, profits are not in any way, shape or form being reinvested in patient care. Uh, it's very much an extractive uh, approach. Um, I think in he healthcare is a little bit unique, at least it's often argued that in the literature. And this is where I would go to what Bruce was saying um, we do have a long history in the U.S., and I would say a, a very effective history until about the 1950s and 60s of mutual benefit corporations. And, and these are a beautiful legal structure. Um, 
that unfortunately were, were basically raided and privatized. Uh, but they, they are a, a structure where profits are made very transparently. Those profits have to be reported back to the members and then those profits are reinvested in the members' health care. I hope I um, gave, gave you some edge cases anyways. And you're absolutely right. Europe is far better and Margarita's experience with cancer this last year was a, a, a vivid demonstration to us of that. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. My great pleasure. I hope I provoked you all. <laughs> I, I, I want you to say a little bit about the PEACE data standard and where is that at with IEEE? And then talk a little bit about that. Oh, uh, happily so. So we're working on what's called the Hague PEACE data standard. We're looking at um, taking this kind of um, social interaction data that is generated by um, a whole lot of the technology that we all use in our, our daily lives now um, and making sure that it gets democratized. So at least those of us who are creating it every day also have access to this data. Um, also working on making sure that it gets used uh, to give all of us a, a good high resolution um, measurement of exactly how much positive peace, and I, I would just, again, I define positive peace in terms of, of uh, active behavior rather, rather than passive lack of violence. Um, so uh, using this to help all of us understand better where we are all um, creating the most positive impact. The, uh, the work with IEEE is um, temporarily at a standstill while we look at other standards providers. Um, there, there's um, uh, some interesting uh, opportunities here with um, with ISO and NEN and so on, and this is that's all subject to funding. Um, we'll um, be circling back with IEEE again, uh, I think, in the fall. Meantime, um, for all of you who are interested in this notion of using centers and using uh, data to quantify um, social impact at very high resolution and in real time. I point you towards uh, the call for papers by our colleagues coming out of uh, Cambridge University Press. That, um, it's the Data and Policy Journal, uh, and it is um, uh, if you Google Peace Data and Cambridge University Press and Data and Policy Journal, you'll find the call. And there, there's excellent uh, opportunities there for any of you who need an, an opportunity to publish in this in this field. Thank you, Mark. My great pleasure. Thank you all for your interest.